uh, without further ado, I'm thrilled to announce Dr. Stephen Schaefer as today's distinguished speaker. Uh, Dr. Schaefer received the editor, served as the editor of chief of anesthesia and analgesia from 2006 to 2016. Um, during this time, he was involved in the identification of several cases of serial fraud, um, including Dr. Bolt, um, the author with the most retractions for fraud, according to Retraction Watch. And I personally followed that case quite closely and was just fascinated um, both with sort of the, the series of events, but especially Dr. Schaefer's seminal role in this whole process of identifying fraud. Um, also, Yoshitaka Fuji and the authors were the second, uh, with the second most retractions. Um, Dr. Schaefer has been involved in the retractions for um, the author with the third most retractions, as well as number eight on the list, and Scott Rubin. Dr. Schaefer has been a director of the Committee on Publication Ethics and is currently on the board of directors for the Center for Scientific um, Integrity. So, um, Dr. Schaefer, thank you again for sharing your history, your wisdom, and uh, we have a lot to learn from you. So, please um, take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have to laugh a little bit because I, I've spent my academic career primarily understanding drug pharmacology and looking at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of, of drugs, uh, both in perioperative medicine and elsewhere. <laughs> but I'm actually known for, for academic misconduct. That's what my primary reputation is based on, um, other than a few people who know me relative to the death of Michael Jackson. So it's sort of odd things that that uh, was certainly not sought after. Um, when I stepped down as the editor in chief of Anastasia, I actually had, I was a world record holder. I, I don't run very fast. I can't hit a ball very far, but I, I held the world's record for the most retractions ever by a medical journal editor. Um, I was very pleased when that record was broken a few years later as other journals have started to be more careful about uh, academic misconduct. And, um, uh, and I, I'm now a distant, I don't know, 10th or something like that. Um, but I, I, I've spent a lot of time dealing with academic misconduct. Um, and, and here's a picture, and I'm gonna to talk today, I originally was gonna talk about misconduct in general, but I think today I'm gonna to talk instead just about one aspect, which is plagiarism. And the reason, of course, is plagiarism has been in the news. But the point about misconduct and, and, and retractions and plagiarism is it's not just the manuscript seen here, it's a whole domino effect. And it starts with the manuscript, then you have the reputation of the author, the co-authors, the institution. Anesthesia and analgesia retracted, I think like 50 papers on my watch. Um, I think it improved overall the journal because it was known as a crap journal when I started. And I think it's now considered a reasonably respected journal. But you know, we, we took a hit because of the amount of just poor peer review and junk that was able to get in the journal and the fact it was targeted by several anesthesiologists as an easy American English language journal in which to publish fraudulent results. Uh, but every retraction, there's all kinds of reviews about these articles. Scott Rubin's work on celecoxib and, and selective COX-2 inhibitors um, was covered in many reviews. All those reviews are uh, are false. Yakum Bolt was covered in many reviews about the safety of head of starch. All those reviews are wrong. It, that, then lectures, people give talks on these. The lectures are wrong. It affects patient care, but I think it's these last two that are really what are so important. It affects the trust that people have in the peer-reviewed literature and more generally, the perception of science. And you've seen in the last few years how, how the science has become politicized, the science of vaccines, the science of infectious disease, um, hugely political topics. And if the public doesn't trust science and doesn't trust the literature, and they are going to get their uh, information about science and what science believes to be true through the, the established through the peer review process. If they're gonna instead get that from social media and YouTube, then we all have a big problem. So I'm gonna start by talking about 
plagiarism. And just because of the topic and the timeliness, I'm not going to talk about other kinds of misconduct. Happy to in the, in the Q&A sections. So looking at plagiarism, uh, oops. Actually, I just committed plagiarism. Um, just in my opening slide, I committed plagiarism. Uh, so a question for people watching the seminar, did you catch it? Did you catch the plagiarism? This is a there's this is a picture. I didn't do this picture, but there is no attribution on this picture. I have taken right here somebody's intellectual output, and I have presented it to you already. This picture up here with no attribution whatsoever. That's plagiarism. This was the original picture. It was actually about misconduct, and here's the author's name, Jana Hurst. But because I'm talking about plagiarism, I just took that part out. And this is actually from the from the uh, cover of Anesthesia and Analgesia during my term as uh, editor-in-chief. And a whole bunch of articles here about plagiarism. You will be caught, policy on conformed consent, shadow of doubt is about Jakob Bolt, two more articles about how research is done in Germany, we're all, and hydroxyethyl starches, what do we still know? Article here about Scott Rubin, uh, about misrepresentation by anesthesia applicants when they apply to residency programs, uh, the role of mentorship and a review of plagiarism detection freeware. A whole issue about anesthesia, about plagiarism, but I just went and took the cover of this and I just put it up as my own artwork. So my question is, why did you miss it? Oops, I did it again. <laughs> I put up an image with no attribution. Actually, oops, I did it again. That's also plagiarized. That's an album cover from Britney Spears. So I just I just plagiarized a third time in the first few minutes of this PowerPoint presentation. And that picture is from Wikipedia. But here's what they say on Wikipedia. If you look at this image, this image is the cover of an audio recording and copyright is most likely owned either by the publisher of the work or the artist which produced the recording or the cover artwork in question. Um, but they say the use of a low resolution image like this is okay if I'm going to talk about the audio recording. Uh, 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 and uh, it's also fair use, which is how I'm using it right now. So does that make it okay that I've used this picture of Britney Spears without a reference? And the answer is no. The reason that that doesn't make it okay is copyright, and we'll get to this later, but copyright and plagiarism are different. Copyright is a legal question about who owns something, uh, whereas plagiarism is about appearing to take credit for the work of others uh, and is, is, is theft of some kind. Uh, so, it, so this is the fact that, that I, I, it's a, maybe a copyright violation. Well, it's not a copyright violation. This is an example of fair use, but there is no attribution, nor is there an attribution on Wikipedia. So Wikipedia doesn't know who did this picture. Um, and so if I keep this up, by the way, and keep plagiarizing every single slide I'm showing to you, maybe I'm going to jail. Uh, <laughs> that's another picture I use for anesthesia and analgesia without attribution. Oops, I did it. Uh, damn it. I almost can't speak without committing plagiarism of some kind here. My point of the intro here is to say that plagiarism is ubiquitous. Uh, think about your own PowerPoint presentations. Think about Wikipedia, who use, where the, people bring in images from all over. Sometimes they know where the image comes from, sometimes they don't. Uh, all of these are kinds of plagiarism, and it's sort of ridiculous to think that we can't use pictures that we find on the internet and stuff for presentations like I'm giving now. Plagiarism is ubiquitous. Uh, unfortunately, that even that text is plagiarized. It's from an editorial that I wrote in ANA, but at least I'm, I'm copying my own words. And I'll get back to this editorial, but when you're copying your own words, let me just say right now and unambiguously, your words belong to you. Even if I've used these words in an editorial here, saying plagiarism is ubiquitous, um, uh, you're, you're, you're free to use your own words. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So as you all know, uh, Claudine Gay, uh, president of Harvard University, um, was actually targeted by people who were upset with how Harvard responded to the conflict in the Middle East, and specifically that Harvard, uh, shortly after the terrorist attacks of October 7th, uh, 
basically defended students who came out and said Israel is responsible for terrorist attacks on Israel. And a lot of people said that's terrorist attacks or terrorist attacks. You know, no, no history uh, would justify such an atrocity. Um, and you have to, it has to be judged by the actual events. She was called up in front of Congress and then they went after her for plagiarism. So she was accused of plagiarism stuff in her textbook by this fellow healer, primarily this guy, Bill Ackman. Bill Ackman is a uh, exceptionally wealthy hedge fund manager. Um, and he accused her of plagiarism, but then about two days later, uh, uh, academics, this is from, um, uh, <laughs> I do have the authors of this here, but this is from Business Insider. Business Insider looked at his wife, who is actually an MIT professor. Um, doesn't necessarily look like an MIT professor in this particular photograph, but she is. She's a, she was for several years a full professor at MIT, and uh, uh, they discovered that she had plagiarized from Wikipedia, scholars from a textbook and other sources with no attribution. So all of a sudden, <laughs> he accuses people of plagiarism, and they look at her thesis, and he says, well, he's going to go after everybody else for plagiarism. So... When it comes to misconduct, there's a couple things uh, that makes plagiarism complicated. The first thing is it's not obviously wrong. Uh, how many of you wrote book reports in the fourth grade? Uh, I certainly did. And, and science reports, I had to write things uh, about you know various kinds of science reports in the fourth grade. And I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, and uh, my parents had a huge encyclopedia on the shelf. And I remember going through, and I probably copied a bunch of those sentences verbatim. And I'm sure that I didn't have a lot of references in the scientific reports I wrote in the fourth grade. And did the teachers ever comment on it? No, they were just happy to see that I read something and wrote about it. Um, it wasn't taught. Now, I was taught that lying is wrong. I was taught that deceit was wrong. But this, but just copying something from the Encyclopedia Britannica was not part of what I was taught in the fourth grade because. It, it didn't really seem wrong to anybody, and I suspect fourth grade teaching hasn't changed much. It differs among cultures. In some cultures, it's actually a form of respect to use the words of people who are famous, people who are somewhat idolized, uh, people who are respected elders. And let me just point out that all that glistens is not gold. Well, clearly that's a quote from Shakespeare, and all of you recognize that that's a quote from Shakespeare. Um, is that plagiarism that I am using it without saying, as Shakespeare said, and then putting the words in quotes? Uh, technically, yes. Functionally, no, because I would expect that the reader would recognize it. But there's some there's a cultural aspects to plagiarism. And what we think is cut and dry is not at all cut and dry among cultures. We have very different standards for spoken language, for written language, and for PowerPoint. Um, it occurs to me, by the way, that e to the pi i equals minus one. <laughs> I have no idea who told me that. Uh, that's certainly not something that I could come up with. I just said that without any attribution, because I have no idea who taught me that. So in spoken language, you wouldn't expect me to say, as, and some famous mathematician pointed out if you use I think it's Riemann uh, coordinate systems, then you can easily show that e to the minus pi, e to the pi i is minus one. But I have no idea who told me that. Spoken language, we aren't expected to reference everything that we say. In written language, we have to be much more careful. Where, where does PowerPoint come in, like, we're, like this presentation? I think we give people a pass on PowerPoint. And we just say on PowerPoint, it's nice to have references if you can but everybody picks little things off the internet. Wikipedia picks little things off the internet. And we just accept that there are different standards. This is quite different, for example, from deceit. If I, am, if I say something which is clearly wrong, if I put up a PowerPoint presentation where I tell you that the MR vac mRNA vaccines have caused 10 million deaths worldwide, you know, that's false. And that's deceit. I am intending to deceive the audience or, or I just don't know better. Um, Getting along with along, going along these lines, intemperate allegations of plagiarism are boomerangs, as Bill Ackman discovered when he accused Claudine Gray of plagiarism, and people found exactly the same kind of plagiarism in the writings of his wife. Somebody could take my presentation here and say, "Look, Dr. Schaefer just committed plagiarism. He didn't attribute his very his, these images, and he quoted Britney Spears' album cover without meaning to without crediting it to her." So 
I, I do think we all need to be a little bit paranoid because plagiarism slips into our writing and I'll cover that at the very end. But if I'm gonna, if I'm here to give you a recommendation, it's to be a little bit paranoid in your own writing uh, about plagiarism. So I'm gonna start by offering a taxonomy of plagiarism. The first kind is intellectual theft. In intellectual theft, that's dishonest. That is intentional deceit because you are trying to take the credit for the rigor of another scholar. You want to take what they have produced, put your name on it, and receive the credit for their intellectual work. And that's wrong. And that is serious misconduct. Intellectual sloth is that we're taking something that somebody else did, but it's just not worth the effort to go and credit it. And we, we do that in speaking constantly because we don't remember where we, we don't remember how to credit everything. And we do that in PowerPoint on literally every PowerPoint presentation you'll see, you, you'll likely find examples of intellectual sloth. Um, it's just, it is, we are, we are expected to produce so much and we go to the internet for so many things that we cut and paste and pull and, and, and assemble stuff that sometimes it's hard to even figure out you know, what needs attribution and what does not need attribution. There's plagiarism for scientific English. So I, I don't know how many people there have written articles in Mandarin, but uh, writing a paper in a language that you don't speak strikes me as a nearly impossible task. And people who are trying to put a manuscript into English will take the text that they think says what they want to say. They will put that into Google and Google will find text that very nearly matches it. And they will cut and paste that text from a scientific paper that Google says is a good match to what they typed in, in order to have the grammar corrected. And so you get these papers in patchwork plagiarism uh, particularly, like, like I get a lot of papers, I, I handle probably, I don't know, a thousand papers from China, maybe more, when I was editor-in-chief. And some of these papers, every single line, when I run it through Authenticate, my plagiarism checking software, every single line was copied from another manuscript. But that's, they're not trying to steal anything, they're just trying to convert things into proper English. Uh, so this is not intentional deceit, this is just struggling with the English language. And if I was trying to write something in Mandarin, I might do the same thing do my best with Google Translate to put something into, into Mandarin and then put it into uh, Google and have Google find something in Mandarin that looks like the same characters. Maybe, maybe this will work. There's technical plagiarism. Technical plagiarism is when you aren't really trying to do anything wrong. You just forget to put it in quotes. You forget, you, you don't put the reference in the right place. It's plagiarism, but it's just because you screwed up how you did it. And then there is self-plagiarism. Um, I feel very strongly about this issue of self-plagiarism. If you write something, you own those words. As long as you're not trying to duplicate, engage in duplicate publication, where you're trying to take the exact same results and submit it as a second publication somewhere, you are free to use your own words. People jump through all kinds of hoops. Oh my gosh, I'm writing another paper. I run it through a plagiarism checker and my description of the assay is identical. Well, thank God it's identical. If you're using the same assay, use the same words. Why would you change it? They're your words. If you've got a good description, use them. If some idiot journal editor writes back and says, you have used your own, you, you're copying this. It's like, I wrote that before. I'm not going to change it. And I'll tell you personally, as somebody who checks papers against prior papers and stuff, if the methods are the exact same, but they've changed a couple of words or they've rearranged sentences, I scrutinize it to figure out What's different? Because something's got to be different because they're using a different description. And sometimes it's just, you know, they're trying to avoid self-plagiarism. Don't. They're your words. They belong to you. You don't. And, and by the way, this is part of the difference between copyright. If, a, if some journal wants to sue you because you've used the copyrighted description of an essay, just tell them to go to hell. They're your words. They belong to you. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of case law behind that as well. So here's an example of intellectual theft, paper by Venata Trivedi. Um, 
continuous cervical epidural analgesia for ischial type 1 thyroplasty. This paper was originally sent to me as the editor-in-chief of anesthesia and analgesia. That's one of uh, five papers that I received on the same day from this author who's at the M.P. Shah uh, Medical College in India. She's one of two full professors. I ran it through a plagiarism checker and the whole thing's plagiarized. A year later, I went online just to say, did she ever publish this paper? And here it is. She published it in the Indian Journal of Anesthesia. Well, you can see we've, it's, it describes case one, case two, case three, anesthesia technique, all the stuff that supposedly she did. It's got these pictures here. You can also, by the way, use Google to search for pictures. That's, you can do Google image searches. So anyway, here's the description of this published here. So here's these cases, case one, case two. Uh, case one is not plagiarism that I could find, but this text right here is copied literally verbatim. This right here is copied from the British Journal of Anesthesia. This one right here is copied from the University of Iowa, their website. This right here is copied uh, from the Hong Kong Medical Journal. She didn't do these cases. When I did image searches, this these aren't images. This image is from the University of Iowa. This image is actually from Stanford, uh, the otolaryngology clinic. And this image right here is from the University of Pittsburgh, including the arrows, by the way. These aren't her pictures. This is intellectual theft. She is taking stuff done by other people and trying to pass it off as her own work. Uh, and in fact, if you even take this picture right here and blow it up, you can see University of Pittsburgh down here on the image. So I wrote to the editor uh, of the Indian Journal of Anesthesia about this. Uh, and for quite a long time, I never heard back from him. Uh, but you can see she's a professor of anesthesia at the MP, College, MP Shah Medical College. But I checked yesterday. And when I checked yesterday, it was eventually retracted uh, for, for plagiarism. Well, the saga continues. Uh, this is a paper. I went to look for her CV. Uh, and uh, I went to look at the, at the MP Shah Medical College here. And this is a comparison of the sedative hip hemodynamic and respiratory effects of dexmedetomidine and propofol in children undergoing magnetic resonance imaging, published in 2011 in the Saudi Journal of Anesthesia. And I thought, that's interesting. That sounds familiar. And this is a paper that I accepted for publication in my first year as editor-in-chief. A comparison of the sedative hemodynamic and respiratory effects of dexmedetomidine and propofol in children undergoing magnetic resonance imaging. And it's pretty remarkable here. Here are the tables. Age, four, plus or minus 1.88. Age, four, plus or minus 1.88. That's in the dex group. In the propofol group, three, plus or minus 2.03. Three, plus or minus 2.03. Not only is this plagiarism, this is a really shitty job of plagiarism. I mean, to use the exact same numbers, 14 plus or minus 4.14, 14 plus or minus 4.14, 14 plus or minus 4.57, 14 plus 4.57. I mean, all the way down it's plagiarized with the exception of the duration of MRI. This is 34, this is 22, this is 33, this is 25. <laughs> Why would they change the MRI and nothing else? The text is exactly the same between the two. So the Saudi Journal of Anesthesia, edited by a very dear friend, uh, I, he, I wrote to him and and we said, oh my gosh, this is just insane. So we both, uh, Abdelazim and I both published this editorial simultaneously uh, in both of our journals. Uh, this is the latest installment in the ongoing saga of misconduct from MP Shah Medical College. In 2009, Vedana Trevetti, only one of only two professors, uh, submitted five manuscripts to anesthesia and analgesia. Four were rejected for egregious plagiarism. And the fifth one was different because she reported data previously published by other investigators as her own, it was rejected for fraud. In other words, she did not do those studies. That was the one I showed you. Uh, oh, actually that was a different uh, paper uh, than this one. That was a study of 50 cases, but it was not her data. It was somebody else's data, which I tracked down that she publishes her own data. So caveat lector, that means reader beware. 
I wrote to MP Shaw Medical College many times, received zero responses. I received zero responses from their dean, from the president, uh, from their research committee. They were not interested. So reader beware. Now this is an example of intellectual sloth. This is from a submission to anesthesia and analgesia. The text in red, I'm gonna start reading the text in red, additionally, fetal hemoglobin. And actually I invite you to read uh, uh, the uh, read the red text while I read down here from uh, Wikipedia. Additionally, fetal hemoglobin has a 10 to 15% higher affinity for carbon monoxide than adult hemoglobin, causing more severe poisoning in the fetus than in the adult. All elimination of carbon monoxide is slower uh, in the fetus, leading to an accumulation of toxic chemicals. The level of fetal mortality and morbidity uh, and mortality in acute carbon monoxide poisoning is significant. So despite mild maternal poisoning or following maternal recovery, severe fetal poisoning or death may still occur. Identical text cut and pasted from Wikipedia. Is this plagiarism? Well, yes. I mean, it really should be referenced. On the other hand, Wikipedia, they say very plainly, our stuff is public domain. Use it as you see fit. So that's more of a copyright issue that this is somebody else's words. You're kind of taking credit for this scholarship here, but it's general knowledge. The whole point of Wikipedia is this is things that, is, that are general knowledge. Uh, although the Wikipedia author has referenced the individual things here, as you can see uh, in, in their editing of Wikipedia, this author is just cut and pasted. This is the kind of thing that happened to Claudine Gay and also happened to uh, Naomi Oxman, uh, the uh, wife of Bill Ackman. Uh, and people do this all the time. Yes, it's plagiarism. I, I, this is not, in my view, a shootable offense. Uh, this is people just being lazy. You ought to say, I got this from Wikipedia. On the other hand, Wikipedia says it's not copyrighted, have at it. I, I don't get exercise over this, but I won't publish it either. And so when I would catch this, and uh, I screened over 10,000 papers during my period as editor-in-chief, when I would catch this, I would write back to the authors and say, this is from Wikipedia, you've got to reference it. Either rewrite it in your own words, which you don't need to do, just reference Wikipedia, that's perfectly fine. Wikipedia is a perfectly reasonable reference. Um, so, uh, but I wouldn't publish it. I'd just say, this is wrong. And partially I'm doing that, not so much to protect ANA, although it's a little bit for that, it's to protect the authors. If I had handled the papers for Claudine Gay, <laughs> she would not have had the, uh, the, the plagiarism that caused her to step down at Harvard. Same with Naomi Oxman. And uh, if you start screening other people's work, same with everybody else. This is really to protect the authors from like, accusations of plagiarism. So this is intellectual sloth. This is plagiarism for scientific English. This is a very unhappy example. The effect of celiac plexus block in critically ill patients, intolerant of enteral nutrition, a randomized placebo controlled trial. This is a trial that was actually done by these investigators, but color coded blocks here are copied verbatim from other manuscripts. It is written in essentially perfect English by a series of investigators in Turkey, Dilek Memis is a, was a very highly regarded investigator. But I found these blocks of, that are plagiarized texts, each color represents different texts. It's, it's not in the results. They actually did the study. It's in how they describe the study and the results. So I wrote back to Dilek Memis and I said, unfortunately, there's a lot of plagiarism in this paper. I have to retract it. And I received a reply from her in very, very rough, grammatically awkward English. She speaks Turkish. She doesn't speak English. Her co-authors here are the ones who, who are all her trainees, are the ones who engaged in plagiarism. She had no idea. She can't read it. She's not able to assess that this has plagiarism. But we published this uh, in 2010. And then I discovered the plagiarism. Somebody pointed it out to me, a reader pointed this out to me and said, this is plagiarized. And so I had to retract it. Dr. Memis was fired from her position. Very, a, a, a good investigator. One of the stars in Turkish anesthesia, but her institution looked at this and said, you know, you're a, you're a deceitful, dishonest position and they fired her. And to my view, 
The only thing is she did wrong is she didn't screen her own papers. But she had no way of knowing that, that some, one of the other authors had cut and pasted this in here. And I felt terrible for the outcome, but it's the editor. I had no choice. I can't let this be part of the published record in anesthesia and analgesia. This is technical plagiarism. Uh, this is a, a paper submitted by a very prominent uh, UK anesthesiologist. And this is what he wrote. When a coin falls on one of its two sides, one bit of information is obtained. Whereas a six-sided die provides approximately 2.6 bits of information, you know, when it finally lands on one number. Any conscious experience, even one of pure darkness, must be extraordinarily informative since countless other experiences have occurred. And this references Alkire and Huddits. Uh, a paper in science in 2008. These are great researchers uh, associated with the anesthesia department. And this paper they wrote in science about consciousness and anesthesia. Well, I sent this to Akira uh, for review. And Akira wrote back and said, it's plagiarized for my paper in science. And sure enough, here's if you read the paper in science, and I'll read down here, you can read up here with me. When a coin falls on one of its two sides, it provides one bit of information, whereas a die falling on one of six sides provides 2.6 bits. But then having any conscious experience, even one of pure darkness, must be extraordinarily informative because we could, we could have had countless other experiences instead. Uh, think of all the frames of every possible movie. So the author has actually quoted the exact words of the authors. Now, they're not trying to steal anything. You know, they even reference, each sentence is referenced to Alkir, but they didn't put it in quotes. So it sounds like it is their own wording, their own phrasing, but they're not trying to steal anything. I mean, this is, they reference Alkir's work. They're, they're, they're crediting Alkir with it. It's technical. They just didn't do it right. They didn't put quotes around it. Um, and so again, as the editor, I wrote back to the authors and I said, this is plagiarized. You just got to put quotes. Or you can say, you know, quoting Alkir and then put, you know, say it in quotes. And you can just quote the whole thing and just reference it at the once down here at the end of it. This is technical plagiarism. I still send it back to the authors because I can't publish this because otherwise the authors might be accused in some future date by somebody who doesn't like them of plagiarism. Here's self-plagiarism. I'm just going to quote myself here. Two papers that I published on the kind of methodologies that I use in, in fitting a model. Uh, you, you look at the left, I'll read on the right. The inter-individual error on each of the model parameters, V1, V2, V3, CL1, CL2, CL3, was modeled using a log normal variance model. Equation two, where P i is the parameter of an individual and eta i is the random variable that describes inter-individual variability, yada, yada, yada. Now, text is, is verbatim identical or very close to verbatim identical. These are my words. This is how I describe my methodology. And nobody's going to take these words from me. And it doesn't, this is not plagiarism. This is, you're, you are, you are own your own words. Publishing doesn't deprive you of the right to publish them elsewhere. And it's very awkward to say, as I have said before, <laughs> I mean, who says that? All right. So I wrote this editorial called You Will Be Caught. I wrote this um, in response particularly to the uh, plagiarism of Dr. Memis, uh, because I felt so horrible that she had been caught plagiarizing because it so profoundly affected her career. And in my view, she actually didn't do anything wrong given the standards of publication in 2006. Um, actually, it's 2010, I guess. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines plagiarism as the practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off as one's own. And that's a pretty straightforward definition. Uh, I offer a taxonomy of plagiarism and I review this taxonomy of plagiarism. And I explain that we have started with 100% manuscript screening. And here's examples of manuscript screening with a program that I use called Ithedicate. At the time it was called Crosscheck. Um, this is a program that I still use today. Uh, during my tenure as editor in chief, we screened every single submission and I personally reviewed them. Um, I reviewed them, I said I reviewed over 10,000 manuscripts. Uh, we now screen every paper that's submitted to the ASA monitor where I screen papers for plagiarism. And authors from top institutions writing for the ASA monitor, they will cut and paste all the time. And we catch something every month uh, by authors who have unacceptable plagiarism in their 
submissions to the ASA monitor. What do these numbers mean? These are the, the, the fraction of the report which it tracked down to something else. These numbers are uninterpretable if you just look at them. The reason they're uninterpretable is oftentimes they actually refer to their own publication. So uh, I did a study um, looking at the uh, bioavailability of propofol if you drink it. Now, the reason I did this is that uh, in the Michael Jackson trial, uh, the attorneys for Conrad Murray claimed that Jackson killed himself by drinking a bottle of propofol. Well, propofol has 100% metabolism and uh, in the liver. And as a result, you can drink as much propofol as you'd like. First pass metabolism gets all of it. Nothing reaches the systemic circulation. So I did a study with some colleagues uh, in preparation for the trial uh, where they took like 50 mils of propofol. They actually videotaped it. And they got a big syringe of propofol. They kind of it's like the whole thing down and swallow it. And then they kind of look at each other and go, you know, what's going to happen? And the answer is nothing happened. And they took blood samples, nothing measurable, 100%, 100% first pass metabolism. So I wrote that up and published it as an abstract. And then a couple of years later, I went and submitted it to anesthesia and analgesia. And the editor at that time, who uh, was, uh, let's just say, not competent, <laughs> that's a good word, looked at my paper and said, it's plagiarized, 50%. And I wrote back and I said, Yes, it's plagiarized. It's plagiarized from my abstract. I wrote an abstract. I'm describing the results in the same way I described it in the abstract. I should describe it in the same words. Uh, and it's not plagiarized. And he said, well, you're text recycling. I said, these are my words. Look at your own guide to authors, which I wrote. And it says, this is, this is encouraged. It's, people are encouraged to write abstracts. And if you summarize the results in a manuscript, you're encouraged to use the same words. And he never got back to me. And I've never submitted to anesthesia and analgesia since, since I consider the review process incompetent. You can't look at the numbers. You have to look at what was copied and the context of what was copied. And here's an example of a paper uh, from uh, two authors. So, well, OK, these words are copied. This is an exact quote, quote from another paper. The author helped design the study and write the manuscript has seen the original data, reviewed the analysis. Of course, these are ex exact quotes. We ask authors to describe what they did and we offer this as a sample. They use it our sample. So this whole, there's 5% of this whole manuscript is copied from another paper in a and and they're just using our boilerplate material. So the fact that 5% is copied doesn't mean anything. And you have to go through and actually look at what was copied, where it was copied from, and is it the author's own words? And if there are two papers and there is one author in common between two papers, I allow that author to take the words from one paper and use them in another. So I don't know who wrote what in a paper, but if they contain the same author and you have to actually check, you know, institutions and where they were and stuff, but this, is, this takes a lot of work. But if it's the same author, then they're allowed to take the words from one paper to another paper. I think one of the most egregious examples of plagiarism is textbook chapters. And many of you may have done this yourselves without realizing it. Book publishers do not realize that when they are, when they have a serialized textbook and the author of edition number six says, I'm tired of doing this textbook, go to somebody else. So the editor suggests, oh, go to this person. So they say, here's this, here's the text, here's the chapter from edition six. Can you please update it? So the person does that and they update the chapter. It's then published with that person's name on the chapter. Well, most of the work was written by the prior authors. That person maybe contributed just a couple paragraphs, but their name is on the entire text. It's all plagiarized and it's egregious. It, writing book chapters is hard. A typical book chapter for me takes a month of work. If I write a book chapter for chapter for edition six, I do it de novo because I haven't been asked before. So I just start from scratch. And then edition seven comes out and I said, I don't want to do it. So somebody else takes their name, makes a couple trivial changes and puts it on my intellectual work. And now they take credit for the chapter. That's theft. It happens all the time. And some of you may have done this as invited chapter ed authors on these multi-edition textbooks. And some of you may have facilitated this. And the problem is if you ask the company, can I do this? They say, oh, it's fine, it's not fine. We own the copyright. This isn't an issue of copyright. 
Copyright is a legal issue over who has the rights to the words and the company has the right to do whatever they want to. This is an issue of, of fraud. This is an issue of academic integrity where the author, in this case, I write a textbook, the next author puts his or her name on my intellectual work. It is theft, pure and simple. So at least in NS, so this was done by two anonymous authors and Larry Sademan, one of the really highly respected senior statesmen in our specialty, who, by the way, is receiving outstanding care at Stanford for a couple of things that Stanford has done fabulous job caring for. Um, and uh, I said, I'm not going to publish something that's totally anonymous. Uh, I need I need an author who, like a corresponding author. So Larry said, okay, I'll step in as the corresponding author. But what we have here are copies of the textbook chapters. And what I have done is I've intentionally blurred them because the authors here are like really senior, important kingmakers in our specialty. Those are the editors. The, the editors who facilitated this are kingmakers and both authors of textbook chapters were afraid of their academic careers by outing the role of these powerful editors in facilitating theft and facilitating fraud. So that's why it's anonymized and that's why there's a blur. But if you look at each page, the, the parts of the page in yellow are from the prior chapter that either author one or author two wrote. This is author one, this is author two. And what the new author wrote are just these trivial sections here and some, some new references put in here. This is egregious. It's still plagiarism and it is an everyday occurrence. After publishing this, I received probably 30 to 40 letters just sent to me personally from people who were pissed off because this had happened to them. They had written a textbook chapter and then five years later, a new edition comes out and here is somebody else's name on their work. And they were still seething over the theft of their work by another author who was told by the publisher it's okay because the publisher owns copyright. Copyright is not the same as theft, as, as taking the, the credit for the intellectual rigor of the prior authors. In anesthesia textbooks now, by the way, what you see is uh, the prior authors will still be included as current authors. So I've got to, I've got to read a textbook chapter from Miller. Uh, I wrote the chapter, I think 10, maybe 15 years ago, is passed on to a new set of authors, but they've kept my name on it because a lot of it is still my work. And so I've got to get back to them. I'm like, oh shit, I'm still on that chapter. But I, I need to be there. I wrote it. You know, it's, it, they, they said, you have to be there. We, we don't want to rewrite this. Um, so, all right, I'll, I'll read through it. This was the cover of the issue about uh, plagiarism is plagiarism is plagiarism. We had a whole bunch of things. Uh, and this is the idea that, you know, people do scrutinize this, they find the plagiarism, and it's, it's wrong. So I'm going to end with this editorial, plagiarism is ubiquitous. I told you I'd get back to that. Let's see how my time is. My time's good. I'm just going to read you the editorial verbatim. I apologize for reading off the screen, but this is kind of fun. My decision letter to the corresponding author began gently, and I've written a lot of decision letters like this. Anesthesia and analgesia has instituted 100% screening of manuscripts for plagiarism. I explained that our plagiarism detection software, CrossCheck, now called Authenticate, has identified passages of text as having been taken verbatim from a previously published manuscript. I'm quoting from a decision letter I, I mailed out to authors. To the decision letter, I attached a copy of the submission to anesthesia and analgesia with the plagiarized text highlighted and a copy of the manuscript that was plagiarized with the same text highlighted. I also attached the similarity report from CrossCheck showing multiple blocks of text copied verbatim from previously published papers. All but one paragraph represented self-plagiarism by the senior author. In other words, the senior author had taken things that that author had written and used them again. But if I said you're, oh, that you're allowed to do that, you are, nobody ever takes the right from you to use your own words. It's not plagiarism. But there was one paragraph in the methods it was cut and pasted from a totally different paper. None of the authors were in common. It was plagiarism, pure and simple. Finally, I have attached my editorial, You Will Be Caught, describing anesthesia and analgesia's plagiarism policies. Now, st I'm still reading from the editorial here. So this is more of my editorial, the next paragraph. What made this decision letter memorable was that I was the senior author. <laughs> Because decision letters are implicitly directed to all authors, I had just sent myself a decision letter 
identifying plagiarism in one of my submissions. If I had not caught that, I would be like, you know, Delic Memis with plagiarism put in by one of the other authors. They cut and paste it from somebody else's methods. They put it in a paper. I'm the senior author. I didn't know. Next paragraph. I'm in good company. Since instituting 100% screening for plagiarism in 2010, I have sent letters identifying plagiarism to department chairs, medical school deans, editors in chief of other journals, and approximately half the members of the anesthesia and analgesia editorial board. Plagiarism is ubiquitous. We all use cut and paste. We are all under time pressure for everything we do. Making sure that every cut and paste has an appropriate reference and that everything is cited or that every figure you use in PowerPoint has a little thing underneath it where you got it from is an enormous pain in the neck. And we take shortcuts because we're pressed for time and because cut and paste is so effortless. So this shows, uh, before I started 100% screening, uh, I identified plagiarism in some papers, 2008, 2009. I started in 2006. And here I would just screen papers where I had some suspicion. 2010, papers where I had some suspicion. Once I started screening every paper, I started realizing how much more there was. This is the total amount of plagiarism. This is intellectual theft, intellectual sloth, plagiarism for scientific English and technical plagiarism. In every one of these cases, I wrote back to the authors. I, the, paper didn't, I, the paper stopped at that point in time in peer review. And I wrote back to the authors and I said, here's a problem and we need to fix it. And I gave the authors the opportunity to correct it. Here's what came of the opportunity. Plagiarism for intellectual sloth from 2008 to 2015, uh, I identified 172 papers. I stepped down in 2016. So um, there's, there's more papers than covered in this period here, not much. But I identified intellectual sloth in 172 papers. I gave the authors the chance to revise them. Only two authors did. And I wound up actually accepting those papers. This is an intellectual theft. I'm sorry, this is a true theft. Why did I accept papers where there was intellectual theft? Well, basically it was it was sort of like my the paper that that was had my name on it. It was I would classify as intellectual theft. I mean, somebody was taking something, but they explained that it was like a, a method and they forgot to reference it. And this was, I mean, it was a mistake. They admitted the mistake. They said that they would institute 100 percent screening of all future papers and to reward them for instituting policies of 100% screening, which you know they sent me the departmental policies and stuff showing this new departmental policy, I said, we'll move forward. And otherwise they were, they were good papers. For intellectual sloth, you know, that's like the quote from Wikipedia. And maybe that section of a description of a statistical technique in, in my paper, maybe that's intellectual sloth, but you know, over half of those authors elected to revise them 79% elected to revise them. And of the revisions, we actually wound up accepting um, about a fifth of the revisions. This is kind of our overall acceptance rate at ANA was 20%. So these papers didn't suffer other than the fact that the authors were protected. Plagiarism for scientific English, only five of them were revised, which was 5%, and only one of those was eventually accepted. The issue with plagiarism for scientific English is not that I'm concerned about it from a, a misconduct standpoint. I mean, these are just people trying to write in English. The problem is, is that it, they're not good papers. If they don't speak English and they're writing from a place that doesn't have a tradition of, of working in the English language, often that's, a, that's highly correlated with not having a tradition for high quality um, reproducible science. And so uh, these papers I despaired. I wanted to give the authors the benefit of the doubt, but they were in fact really not very good papers. And technical plagiarism, I just said, you know, take this, put it in quotes, move your, your whatever is needed. Um, uh, all of the, every single one of those papers, the authors wrote back with the fix that I requested. So it was no longer plagiarism. Uh, and we accepted uh, just 10% of those papers. So in my editorial, I also say this. I mentioned self-plagiarism. You notice it wasn't on my taxonomy here. It's not in the taxonomy here. I mentioned self-plagiarism to dismiss it. Quoting from quoting our guide for authors, the journal does not view self-plagiarism as misconduct. Authors are permitted to reuse their own words and are encouraged to do so. 
when describing identical research methods in multiple papers. So to conclude, I have some recommendations for you. Number one, screen your own papers for plagiarism. You'll do it. You'll find that you commit plagiarism. It's unavoidable. If you do it in PowerPoint, I'm not going to, nobody's going to notice it even. But I, I, I believe that Stanford actually has an Authenticate account for everybody to use. I have my own Authenticate account, and that's what I use. But I screen everything I write through Authenticate because plagiarism happens without you even noticing it. Mentor your trainees about plagiarism. Plagiarism isn't obvious. We were not, we were taught, you know, throughout school. Yeah, you know, thou shalt not lie. Oops, I'm referenced the Bible. <laughs> um, you know, although I think it's more fancy, the wording King James is a more fancy than that. But the point is, you know, we're taught that deceit is wrong. Our parents drill this into us. Deceit is wrong. But plagiarism isn't really about deceit. It's more about theft. And even if it's about theft, are you really trying to deceive someone, make somebody think this is your own words, or are you just simply trying to describe what you did and there was you found another description that worked for you? Um, it's not obviously wrong. Don't obsess about self-plagiarism. I had a call from one of our faculty, a junior faculty, who sent a paper for A and A, and they wrote back and they said, "This is plagiarism." Again, the current, that that editor who just stepped down was a jerk and lazy, not competent and didn't go through the reports. And what they identified was the person has previously sent this in as an abstract. This person was about to give up on academic medicine because they had so committed this egregious error. And I said, what you did was actually perfectly fine. No, this what you did is what I would have done. Write back to the editor in chief about it and say, I'm sorry that this caused a concern. Don't apologize for the plagiarism. Send them a copy of the guide for authors, because I checked. It's, what I wrote is still the guide for authors. Send them a copy of their own guide to authors and say what I did is encouraged by your guide to authors. Um, journal editors who are lazy and check for plagiarism and don't check for and don't allow authors to just use their own words shouldn't be journal editors, in my view. I feel like you have better things to do than worry about how to rewrite perfectly good methods. Or if you wanted to say, this is a such and such is a common problem, and you, you write that in every grant, this is a problem, write it in your papers the same way. The problem hasn't changed. Use the same words. They're your words. On the other hand, <laughs> if all of your results are the same as all of your results of another paper, well, that gets into duplicate publication. Don't, don't do that. And lastly, be forgiving. Even the most egregious cases of plagiarism may have innocent explanations. In the case of Trivedi uh, and MP Shaw Medical College, which I showed you, which was pretty egregious, but I wrote to her multiple times, is do you have an explanation for this? Is there something I'm missing? I can't imagine what it is, but be forgiving, be generous, and assume that even the worst cases are actually about mentorship and people just need more mentorship and they're really not about people trying to steal the way, say, data fabrication uh, and, and, and data ma manipulation and p-hacking and all this stuff is, is really a form of egregious misconduct, plagiarism. Be forgiving. So that's my talk about plagiarism. <sighs> I did it again. <laughs> There's still no reference. Illustration by Jan Hurst. <laughs> With that... Uh, I thank you very much for your, for your time and attention, and, and hopefully this has been useful to you. Dr. Schaefer, thank you so much. Um, really fascinating topic. We do have one question from Jessica Brott in the Q&A. Um, I, I think you covered the first part of her question with authenticate as the recommended service to be able to check all of your own papers, but she also asks, should we hold publishing companies that profit from our work and submissions to journals responsible for providing plagiarism checks and software to peer reviewers and editors? Good question. Um, I think that publishing companies are changing. Uh, I know that I, the editorial about, about textbook chapters being plagiarized and people just putting their names on, I know that at least Lippincott and Walters Kluwer, I believe, Elsevier as well, 
changed their instructions about serial textbooks to tell people if you are just taking a prior textbook and, <clears throat> and using it uh, and updating it, some attribution needs to exist to the prior authors. It can either be including them as a co-author, it can be a footnote on the first page saying the bulk of the chapter is, this chapter has been updated from a chapter written by so-and-so with a reference to the authors, but you can't just put your name on somebody else's work and say it's yours. Um, so there has been some level of responsibility. I think that the responsibility actually sits with the editor-in-chief because the editor-in-chief as part of the uh, guidelines of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, the ICMJE. Um, the, International, the ICMJE has posted responsibilities of editors in chief, and they are personally, they are personally responsible for the integrity of what's in their journal, not the publisher. So the editor in chief can't, if the publisher wants to accept responsibility and the editor in chief wants to designate it, that's okay. But it has to be a designation from the editor in chief. The editor in chief, that's what that's what that's part of the responsibility of the job is ensuring the integrity. Terrific. Thank you. Um, another question from Julie Good. I don't know if you can see these in the QA. Um, she says, Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Very helpful talk. I'm wondering if you can talk about finding the original source to cite. Many times I'm reading reviews, I read the reference cited, only to find the citation is not original. Many times it's being carried forward. Is this a form of plagiarism since the original source is not cited and will software find this? Well, I did this once. So I, I, I'm sure you all know, if somebody's been on steroids, you, you in the OR, you give them 100 uh, milligrams of uh, solimedrol uh, or hydrocortisone or other. So <laughs> try to find a reference for 100 milligrams of, of hydrocortisone for somebody who's been on, on steroids uh, for the perioperative day. And you'll go through review after review and reference after reference after reference. And then finally, I traced it back through about 30 different references to a paper published about you know, one of the first cases of, of you know, you know, cortisone uh, insufficiency uh, in people who had, had, who had stopped taking all of their medications and had been on prednisone prior. And the author just says, we ought to give them something. I don't know, how, how about 100 milligrams? That sounds pretty good. There's no data behind it at all, but but you go through hundreds of references where people find a prior source. Um, the answer is there's no good solution for this, uh, and if, if you want to cite it and want to cite a textbook chapter, that's actually commonly accepted as okay. Is it is it ideal? No, but if somebody's citing something and somebody else has said this, and you're citing that. Well, they they did say this, and it is there. Um, I often do try to go back a couple of references, but if you try to do that for the dose of cortisone <laughs> for the 100 milligrams, you'll spend hours trying to track that down. It, it, it's, it sometimes it's an unsolvable problem. Things just become myth and everybody quotes somebody else who quotes the same myth with no, with no source at all. I have a, a question if you have just a couple more minutes. What is your opinion why in the face of evidence of misconduct of any type, um, plagiarism or otherwise, why do editors choose to slow walk retractions or addressing the issue, communication? I mean, there's a really, you know, there's there's just a very clear barrier here at the leadership level. And I, I'm curious of your thoughts. Yes, um, a couple of reasons. First, um, when I started in at a and I thought we would have zero retractions. I never expected we would have retractions. But we, and we had a, a in the case of Fuji, who, who is the second record holder, Fuji's had like 200 papers retracted. Some German authors wrote into ANA Senator Ron Miller at the time, who was the chair at UCSF, uh, and he was the world's he was the kingmaker in anesthesia in the United States, Ron Miller. And they wrote into him in 2001, and they said, you know, we've looked at ten of Fuji's papers, and every patient in every group, in every group, in every paper, one patient has a headache. Exactly one has a headache as a side effect in every group in every uh, study, and this is like. 30 papers and they looked at the statistical odds of that which are like you know 10 to the minus you know 80th or something ridiculous sort of the limits of precision of whatever the statistical package is and ron and and, and the title of their thing is as sometimes germans do to be very polite they said fuji's data are fuji's data too nice that was the title of it 
And so Ron Miller sent it to Fuji, who obviously didn't understand the, sort of the English subtlety. And he wrote back and said, thank you. I agree. My data are really nice. That was it. Nothing more was done. Clear fraud. And Ron Miller did nothing about it. So when I wrote uh, the retractions for Fuji and this whole thing came to light, I started with an apology for the prior editor doing nothing. Retractions take work. When we finally did the retractions for Joachim Bolt, I contacted the editors of all these journals. Several, in, Bolt was in Germany. Several editors of German publications did not retract for about six years because Bolt personally threatened to sue them. Bolt threatened to sue me, and I just said, be my guest. You know, I'm not the one who lied here. I'm not the one guilty of, of, of fraud, research fraud. Um, you know, give that, a, let's see how that goes. But, but Bolt scared other editors. You've probably heard of the Ames test. Bruce Ames at uh, Oakland Children's developed this, the Ames test for mutagenesis. One of his uh, colleagues was looking at a lab in India and found 40 papers from 40 separate journals by one lab and using statistical methods demonstrated that these papers were all fraudulent. She wrote to editors of 40 journals. Not one of them retracted it. Not one. Only three wrote back and they said, thanks for letting me know. Let me know what else you find. A lot of editors are simply not doing the job. It's changing mm -hmm. and the expectations of editors are changing. But that was in 2000, like the case, case of the thing from Ames Lab, that was like in 2008. So I think in part our response in anesthesia about being so aggressive, about editors banding together to deal with misconduct, uh, set the stage. Uh, the, the people who launched Retraction Watch are the same people who broke the uh, Yock and Bolt story uh, because they were at Anesthesiology News, and I sent Anesthesiology News the, the news about Scott Rubin, uh, the news about Yakum Bolt, because I couldn't. They could publish faster than I could, and I wanted people to know immediately. And so, Retraction Watch itself actually grew out of their experience of watching Anesthesia, kind of I think set the set a pace and, and, and an expectation for how retractions are are to be handled. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Gary Peltz has a question and he's raised his hand. I've been, oh, there, I think maybe I can unmute you, Gary, so you can ask your question. I think I did that. So the answer is, Gary, I, I, I still want to do the pharmacokinetic analysis. I owe you. That may be the question. I don't know if it is. <laughs> but Yeah, it looks like. Oh, yes, I, I, I'm yeah, here to harangue you, Steve. No, I, yeah, I, I'm I, sorry. You know, I, I, I owe I, you a lot of analysis I haven't done. Yeah, you do. I just had a scale and scope question that wasn't sure. easy to put into a chat box. Sure. What, what is the denominator of the findings that you presented with the different types of plagiarism? You just showed the percent of the cases. And secondly, and related to that, you indicated the problem was causing societal uh, disquiet with regard to um, scientific results. And I, I would just comment on that because I'm in the middle of all this with the NIH and rigor and reproducibility and all this kind of stuff. The problem is not so much faking somebody sitting in the basement making up stuff. The problem is a lack of context. You know, I can cure cancer if I perform in a particular type of mouse an experiment on a Thursday facing east. If I change any of those variables, I can't cure cancer. And there's no context, and then people see that the cancer cure doesn't work. I was just wondering if you could put it into context, plagiarism versus other things that lead to societal mistrust. So, you know, both statements are true. The problem of, ir of irreproducibility, and I have a talk on that too. <laughs> I know you do. But, but, but the problem of irreproducibility, um, I, 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 I think that uh, John Ioannidis got it right. He said most scientific papers are false. Um, most of the things that people have published, I think he wrote that in 2005 and PLOS One. But I think that conclusion is probably still true today. So we're talking about over 50% of scientific papers reach conclusions. Um, and the problem there, and you and I have talked about this personally, the problem is places like, you know, top-notch journals, Science, Nature, New England Journal of Medicine, they want to be the first to publish that highly novel, unexpected result. Well, that's exactly the result that is the most likely to not be true. The thing that nobody expected to see probably actually isn't true after all. The result that 
the, the prosaic result. This is the fifth study to show that smoking causes lung cancer. Nobody wants to publish it, but in fact, it's the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, the ninth, tenth studies that show that it's true. And so there's the, the obsession with, sci with novelty, the obsession with impact factor, the obsession with being first makes the problem of reproducibility difficult. But that's a little bit difficult for the public to get their heads around. When the public sees that a person like Joachim Bolt, who was prior to his fall, uh, which was very much, that took a year of my life to do that. Prior to that, he was the president of the German Society of Anesthesiologists, the DGAI, the, I think it's the Deutsche Grammophone Anesthesia Institute or something like that. And, and he was the president of it. He was their most, he was one of the most prominent anesthesiologists in all of Germany. Um, when, the, you know, he made the headlines of Der Spiegel for the fraud. The, the irreproducibility of German anesthesiologists or German scientists in general will never make the cover of Der Spiegel. So I think there's a, even though these fraud cases are um, a relatively modest fraction, the, uh, I, I think I, I retracted 45 papers in total. Uh, and we probably, during that period of time, we probably published about 2000. So that gives you a rough denominator for the number of papers that I wound up retracting for fraud. Um, and and in the plagiarism issue, it was roughly again out of twenty thousand submissions that I handled. Uh, or actually, when I was doing one hundred percent screening, I handled ten thousand submissions, and there were probably two hundred there. So again, you know, it's it's point oh two percent or something. It's, it's a small number. So the magnitude of these problems are totally different. But public perception, people like a good story. You know, irreproducibility is a tough story to explain to a lay reader. The fact that somebody fabricated all these results. You know that's front page news, and so I think in terms of feeding distrust, the effect is, is very, very large. Thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. Um, I know we're a few minutes over, and I want to thank uh, Ashley for all of her support with our webinar series, and today thank all of you for attending. Dr. Schaefer, especially thank you for uh, sharing all of your insights, fascinating history wisdom on the topic, and we would love to have you back again. I Thanks, know. everyone. I have a long list of talks. <laughs> None of which are any good. But I Please, can't. come back. And They're share all plagiarized. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you being here. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.